everything you need to know to get started with intermittent fasting. Whether it's what type of fasting to do for what benefits. We're going to talk about supplements, what supplements work during a fast, what supplements work during your eating period. We're going to talk about common mistakes. We're going to talk about fasting for men versus fasting for women. We're going to talk about how to break your fast. We're going to talk about the right kind of nutrition you should try to get during your eating period. We're going to talk about sleep. We're going to cover a lot. So grab a notepad, grab a pen, take some notes. Feel free to skip through to different chunks of this video. There are timestamps so you can go to exactly where you need to go. No problem. Now we did a similar video to this a few years ago and it took off. It exploded. But things have changed. There's new forms of fasting. There's new evidence. There's some things we shouldn't do anymore that we should do now. So that video still applies. But this is new and improved for 2023. Let's dive in. First and foremost, what is intermittent fasting? Intermittent fasting is not a diet. It is a meal timing pattern. Okay, so it is where you are changing the frequency and the timing of your meals, not necessarily your diet. So for all intents and purposes, you can be applying fasting to whatever kind of diet you're doing. You could be vegan, you could be paleo, you could be carnivore, you could be keto. A lot of the things that I'm going to talk about will absolutely still apply because it's purely a timing system. So as of 2023, what are the forms of intermittent fasting that are most common? Well, let's start with the very, very, very basic one, and that is what is called a 12-12. For what it is worth, that is not legitimately fasting, but that is still what is called time-restricted feeding, where you are making a concerted effort to shrink your eating period and ultimately increase the amount of time that you're not eating. But let's jump to the more popular ones. The most popular one is what is called a 16-8, and that is where you're fasting for 16 hours and eating for eight hours. Now, common misconception is that you have to be eating that entire eight hours, that you have to fill that entire eight-hour period up with food. No, you don't really have to do that. It's more about the timing of when your fast starts to when it ends. So you don't have to be stuffing your face for an entire eight hours. You can eat for four hours, you can eat for six. The bottom line is that the length of your fast should really be 16 hours. One of the rules with 16-8 fasting, in my humble opinion, is that you should take at least two days off per week. Now, five or six years ago, I would have suggested, hey, 16-8 is fine to do every day. The problem that we're starting to see with that is that naturally people start to reduce their calories so much that 16-8 just becomes regular caloric restriction. The vast majority of the benefits that we're extracting from fasting are from caloric restriction, but in second place comes the timing and what periods of time away from food do for our bodies. It's less about saying, hey, let's just eat less and more about how do we take breaks from food. Now, within that 16-8 structure, we can also talk about 18-6, where you're fasting for 18 hours, eating for six, fasting for 20 hours, eating for four, fasting for 21, 22. Once you get over 22 hours, in my opinion, you are now in what is called a prolonged fast. A prolonged fast is where you are not trying to make this more of a daily schedule and you're making it more of a one-off, something you do a lot less frequently. So just to give you some insight, a 16-hour fast will give you benefit as far as insulin levels coming lower, allowing your body to get used to using fats, and it's really sort of the baby step into slightly longer fasts. 18-hour fasts we're now starting to see are where the benefits really kick in. Fat loss revs up quite a bit. Autophagy, which is the cellular recycling, that really starts to kick in after 16 hours. So an 18-hour fast is great for that. Then when you start creeping up towards 20-hour fasts, these are for a little bit more experienced people to do maybe two or three times per week, and a 20-hour fast is great for fat loss. It's great for glycogen depletion to be able to train yourself to be more efficient in your workouts and develop more what's called metabolic flexibility, the ability to switch between fats and carbs. The cool thing is you don't have to sign up for just one and stick with it for the rest of your life. Now that you kind of understand the different frequencies, the different times, you can apply these as you go. But the general rule of thumb, the longer the fast, the less frequently you should do it. The shorter the fast, the more amnesty you are granted as far as frequency is concerned. Then there's what is called time-restricted eating. Time-restricted eating sounds a lot like fasting, but it's where you're focusing on the length of time that you are eating versus the length of time that you're fasting. Okay, so one could fast for 20 hours and then have a two-hour eating period, 
or they could fast for 36 hours and have a two hour eating period. Whereas fasting, the emphasis is on the length of fast, time restricted eating, the emphasis is on the length of the eating period. Potato, potato, but in a lot of ways, you're not binding yourself to the 24 hours in a day. It doesn't matter with time restricted feeding, you're focusing on the time that you truncate your eating period and that's it. And with this video as compared to the one four or five years ago, we can now introduce what's called ETRF, early time restricted feeding. When you think of fasting, you think, I'm only supposed to fast in the morning and then I eat in the afternoon and evening. But the science and a lot of the literature and most of the academic research is now suggesting that we actually do the opposite. We stop eating partially through the day. We stop eating like after lunch around 2 or 3 p.m. And that is what's called early time restricted feeding. This is exceptionally beneficial for people that are trying to restore their sleep. They're trying to improve libido, trying to improve hormone health, and they're trying to recalibrate their metabolism. Because we have to remember our metabolism, our cellular machinery, everything, it coincides, our internal clock coincides with what is called an environmental clock, environmental cues, right? We shouldn't be eating lots of food when it's dark out, things like that. So early time restricted feeding is the same thing as intermittent fasting. You're just changing that you're eating earlier in the day and then fasting through the afternoon and evening. You might be thinking, well, I guess I'll never have dinner again with my family. Not true, okay? You can early time restrict feed three days a week. That's what's beautiful about what we've learned over the last five or six years. Adopting a lifestyle of intermittent fasting isn't so much the cool thing to do anymore. Adopting fasting as a tool that we throw into the mix when we feel like we need to recalibrate and we need to add extra benefit, that's where we are now. Then we have what's called alternate day fasting, another new kid on the block within the last couple of years. Sounds like it is, okay? Fast one day, eat one day. Fast one day, eat one day. 24 hour alternate day fasting is really the gold standard when it comes down to the rodent models. We've seen huge success with rodent model alternate day fasting. Does that mean it's not good for humans? No, there are good human studies too, but when you look at a lot of the rodent model studies, epic, epic results. And the reason that it tends to work really well in humans is sustainability because alternate day fasting allows you a lot of slack. You're fasting for an entire day, then you have an entire day to eat kind of whatever you want. So although I might be shooting myself in the foot for saying this later on, that is what I would consider the flexible dieting of the fasting world. Because you're taking 24 hours off, you're really granted a lot of slack on the days that you eat. And the likelihood of you overeating and compensating for you not eating the day before is very slim. Then we have what's called 5-2. This is like called the Hollywood fast. Now, guys like uh, Kevin Smith, you might know him, he's you know, the director of Mall Rats, Jay and Silent Bob, all that stuff. He really did make a big point of talking about it. Now, the 5-2 approach is where you eat regularly, regular diet for five days out of the week and then fast aggressively on the weekends. So almost like a 48 hour fast, but you could probably do what's called one meal a day on those days as well. Which leads me to just that. What is one meal a day? One meal a day is a form of fasting where you literally just eat one meal a day. So you're just doing it over and over and over again. I have serious problems with one meal a day because people really crush their metabolisms. I do not recommend one meal a day daily. One meal a day could work great if you implement it a few days per week. It's great because it makes people just in a black and white situation where they cannot overthink things. They just say, I can eat one meal. And usually they have a lot of flexibility. But when you have that flexibility, you lack nutrition a lot of times because you're only eating one meal a day. So you might just go eat a ribeye and some birthday cake. And you're kind of missing out on some other phytonutrients, some other things there, which is why from a body composition standpoint, OMAD works great but if you start doing it every day, it could be detrimental. So try doing that just a few days per week. And then in the whole effort category that we'll talk about in another video, you have 24 hour fasts and beyond. Then you are legitimately in the multi-day prolonged fasting world. That is a different conversation that doesn't necessarily apply to intermittent fasting. However, those kinds of fasts are amazing and it's where I've transitioned to more so these days, doing infrequent 36, 48 hour fasts rather than more frequent 16 hour fasts. Let's jump into what is safe to consume during your fasting period. 
There's going to be nuance here and there's going to be outliers, things that are not on my little list here. And you can comment them down below and we'll do our best to answer what we can. So the first one is of course water. Water is always allowed. Sparkling or not, totally fine. Black coffee, totally fine. People might argue that there's a couple of calories in black coffee, but trust me, you're totally fine. The one or two calories you're getting from coffee is largely offset by the cyclic adenosine monophosphate aspect of coffee, as well as the AMPK activation, as well as the caffeine that mobilizes fat. Don't sweat it, sip on the coffee, decaf, caffeinated, it does not matter. Any kind of tea, black tea, green tea, or herbal tea, however, you wanna be cognizant of the herbal teas that have little chunks of fruit and things like that in them. Because you are going to get a little bit of carbohydrates that come from those, and that could spike insulin. One of the big benefits that we get from fasting is massive stabilization of insulin levels. What we face as a society today as a problem is chronic elevation of insulin because of our constant need to eat. We feel like we have to eat all the time. We don't know what it's like to truly be starving. We might get hungry, but we're not starving. So we feel like we need to eat all the time. When you're fasting, insulin levels stabilize. If you have little things like little bits of fruit or little bits of calories that aren't offset by caffeine and things like that, it could be a problem. So with that, teas, coffees, they're fine. Just watch for flavorings and stuff like that. Electrolytes are totally fine during a fast as long as they don't have sugar added to them. Don't be sipping on a Powerade or a Gatorade. Use something like Element or uh, some of these other ones that are out there. Apple cider vinegar, also negligible amount of calories, but hugely beneficial as far as what it can do at the cellular level and for driving up autophagy. Stevia is okay. So beverages sweetened with stevia, those get a green light. Beverages sweetened with monk fruit. Now, there is a little bit of a caveat with monk fruit. Some people have an insulin response to monk fruit. If you wear a continuous glucose monitor or track your blood sugar, you'll be able to see that. If your blood sugar drops when you have monk fruit, it's because it spiked your insulin. Now, that's a different story for a different day once again, so you have to kind of test the waters there. Splenda sucralose, that's a difficult one. We're seeing more and more evidence that there is a powerful cephalic insulin response in about 50% of people with sucralose. What that means is that it does spike insulin about 50% of the time, but it's not always consistent with the person either. You could have an insulin spike from that sucralose today and not tomorrow, I could have a spike tomorrow, but not today. So with that, it's kind of like a wild card, kind of a risk that maybe you shouldn't take. Now, some people are gonna hate me for saying this, and by no means is this a condoning of this, but aspartame, the gnarly stuff that a lot of people avoid, and personally I avoid, that is one that does not seem to spike insulin. So if you're someone that's a diet soda person, and that's your real way of just like hanging on, I don't wanna give you a license to consume as much as you want, but I also have to lean into the evidence and I say that it doesn't seem to spike insulin. Whether it's healthy or not, it doesn't seem to spike insulin. So you might be okay keeping that habit, but personal recommendation would be to stop. Chewing gum, chewing gum is another one. Okay, you've got uh, aspartame in chewing gum. Sometimes you have xylitol. If you're gonna have chewing gum, the aspartame chewing gum is probably the best. Xylitol is interesting, because xylitol, there is some preliminary evidence, some of it mechanistic, that it can cross the blood-brain barrier. You might actually feel a little bit foggy and lose some of the cognitive effects. Another one that comes up a lot is during a fast, can you have MCT oil? MCT oil converts into what are called ketones very fast. So some people, when they're fasting, they'll have MCT oil to get a little bit of a brain rush. Full disclaimer, it does break a fast, okay? but Second to that, you can get a cognitive benefit from it. So if you're fasting for cognitive reasons and not for body composition reasons, I don't think it's an issue. You're not gonna blow up, it's just gonna break your fast for a temporary amount of time. Speaking of breaking a fast, how should we break our fast properly? There's only one major rule with breaking your fast. Protein, 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 protein. When you are in a fasted period, you have a high degree of what's called muscle protein breakdown. This muscle protein breakdown is just like the name implies, you're breaking down muscle into amino acids. Now, you're also breaking down soft tissue ligaments, you're also breaking down proteins through autophagy, you're breaking down components of fat cells through lipophagy, lots of breakdown happening to ultimately uh, break it down into amino acids to provide you with a fuel your body will use that fuel. Now what's interesting is that you don't always break down muscle. Sometimes you break down tissue from another area to sustain muscle, which we'll talk about in a second. But the most important thing is that when you do break your fast, 
you replenish the protein that you lost. So a rule of thumb for protein is one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass that you wish to weigh. So don't tell me that you're 300 pounds and you wanna have 200 pounds of lean body mass. 200 pounds of lean body mass would be pretty insane because that would be like zero body fat. So you try to factor in a couple of things. Like if you wanna weigh 200 pounds, maybe err on the side of caution and say, okay, 150 pounds of lean body mass, lean muscle mass, I'll aim for 150 grams of protein. It's a rough estimate. I don't expect you to know all these equations right in your head, but that's generally where you want to land. Protein should be first, that should be key. So when you break your fast, I usually recommend 25 to 40 grams of protein right when you break a fast. That's the most important thing. Now what to avoid? Okay, I would typically avoid high glycemic carbs when you break a fast. Okay, this is gonna cause a spike in your insulin, which can cause a pretty serious shift in electrolyte balance, but it can also cause a pretty big spike in your blood sugar that your body is just not ready for at that point in time. It's better to bring the carbohydrates in after you've already had the protein come in. So what I recommend is break your fast with protein, turkey, protein shake, eggs, something like that that's relatively lean, as lean as you can, without a lot of carbohydrates. Then approximately 30 to 90 minutes later, then you have more flexibility with your diet. This is a rule that hasn't really changed. The one thing that we've learned more of is that we want to lean into meats that are rich in phosphorus and thiamine, because these are two deficiencies that are happening in people that are fasting longer than like 20 hours. So the best sources of thiamine, the best sources of phosphorus, really you're looking at poultry, specifically turkey. Now, does that mean you run out and you buy all the turkey that you can? No, you can break a fast with a protein shake, you can break a fast other ways, but that would be the ideal protein. Now that we're getting into sort of the foods you wanna eat during your eating period, I wanna mention I popped a 30% off discount link down below for Thrive Market. Now, Thrive Market is an online grocery store, but it's not like a regular grocery store. It's set up by different diet categories. Okay, so you've got keto, you've got vegan, you've got paleo, you've got different diet categories. So it allows you to get the best quality foods, okay, no preservatives, no garbage. You can stock up your whole house, not just your pantry. They have sustainable meat and seafood options, so you can stock up your fridge. They're working on really cool options as well. So you're looking at just everything you can get in a store, essentially, that's gonna be in frozen or in the regular section, delivered to your doorstep. And with this link, you save 30% off your entire first grocery order plus a free $50 gift. So I've also created my fasting bundle, which is things that I recommend people get for breaking their fast and also for sustaining their eating period with the right kind of foods. So that link is in the top line of the description right below this video. I definitely recommend you check them out. They are a sponsor on this channel, but they have been for like five or six years now. And it is definitely where you want to be going as pretty much your one-stop shop almost entirely your one-stop shop for what you can get delivered to your doorstep for your intermittent fasting routine. So a few of the things that are fasting superfoods either during a fast or after a fast. Number one, green tea. Okay, green tea increases your resting energy expenditure, which means it can potentially increase the benefit of your fast. It can potentially improve lipolysis, which means it can drive up the fat utilization during your fast more. Okay, your body is switching gears from glycogen and glucose over to fats. Green tea can help that. It also can potentially drive up autophagy. Okay, now these are all kinds of things that you can get through Thrive Market as well, just FYI. Another fasting superfood that will work either during your fasting period or your eating period is going to be turmeric. Okay, turmeric is what is called a fasting mimicker. So through different mechanisms at the cellular level, turmeric can mimic the effects of a fast, which means when taken during a fast, it might accelerate fasting effects when taken during your eating period, it might extend the effects of your fast into your eating period. So I put turmeric on a lot of stuff. I even put it in my coffee these days. So turmeric is just universally good. As far as the proteins are concerned, I go for two really ideal kinds. I eat a lot of organic turkey breast because again, the phosphorus and the thiamine content and very, very high concentration of protein per ounce. So a very solid, lean form of amazing quality protein, rich with the B vitamins and the minerals that you need to really counter what you lose during a fast. Red meat, and I opt for things like fillets, leaner red meat, and I also opt for ground beef that's very, very lean. I prefer ones that also have ground liver and ground spleen and ground things in it. This is not a plug for this brand, but there's a company called Force of Nature that has uh, ground beef that's mixed with ground liver, ground kidney, and ground heart. The reason I mention 
organ meats is although I'm not liver king, simply because I can't grow that beard, the point is, is that organ meats do provide us with a powerful punch. So if you have the ability to add organ meats into your diet, it's not a bad idea. There are also organ meat supplements if you wanted to add that into the mix to get your heme iron, to get your high levels of vitamin B12, which you deplete during a fast, as well as other B vitamins. You're also looking at various other minerals that are very, very important. So definitely a fan of organ meats or organ meat supplements if you have to go that route. Avocado, okay? Monounsaturated fats are some of the best fats that you could possibly have. Okay, if you're getting lean beef in, you're getting some saturated fat in. If you're having goat cheese and some of these other cheeses I like, you're getting saturated fat in. But I'm a big fan of following a Mediterranean approach. And you're thinking, wait a minute, avocados are not Mediterranean. Those are like from Mexico, right? Very true. But I look at the Mediterranean diet as how the actual foods are stamped out, not necessarily just the geography. Okay, the Mediterranean style diet is high monounsaturated fats, olive oils, macadamia nut oil to a certain degree, other kinds of monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats, high amounts of fish consumption, calamari, shellfish, things like that, legumes in a small amounts, these grains that are probably better for us than what we're getting in the United States, lean meats in general, moderate amounts of protein, aged cheeses. This is the kind of stuff we're looking for. Dry cured ham, cured meats that are cured in the natural way, not adding a bunch of nitrates and nitrites in them. Point is, avocados are a fasting superfood. They satiate you, they help activate what's called PYY and GLP-1, which can actually have huge effects on the brain as well. Also macadamia nuts, another fasting superfood because of not just the monounsaturated fats that improve insulin sensitivity, but macadamia nuts contain a very unique fat called an omega-7. And omega-7s are only found really naturally in one other food, and that's called the sea buckthorn berry, which is a really random thing. So macadamia nuts taste a heck of a lot better. There's practically no carbs in them, and they just make sense. They make sense as far as caloric density is concerned, which we'll talk more about. And they also make sense for insulin sensitivity and cardiometabolic effect. And then of course, fish and other omega-3 rich foods preferably just going the fish category. Don't try to get omega-3s from plants. Now, if I wanna get granular with you, the reason is because it improves what's called mTOR phosphorylation, which means that you're more insulin sensitive and you're more receptive to sort of the muscle growth properties of protein. So if you eat protein and you have adequate omega-3s, you will synthesize that protein, spike mTOR better, and ultimately recover better. So omega-3s help with the muscle building through the recovery pathway. Very, very, very important after a fast when things have been breaking down. So whenever possible, try to squeeze some high omega-3 sardines, mackerel, salmon, things like that into your eating period. Now let's move into some more of the fun stuff, the rules, the mistakes, the things you really need to know outside of eat this, don't eat that. The number one rule of fasting, I've said this before, is work out during your fast. Move your body during your fast. It has to be said because people think I'm not eating, I shouldn't move. It's actually the opposite. If you're not eating, you need to move because if you're not moving, the body's just gonna break down tissue because it's deemed irrelevant and not important. If you fast and you sit on the couch, the body's gonna say, uh-oh, this guy's starving, so we better start eating this muscle because clearly he's not using it. But if you're fasting and you're working out and you're doing resistance training, the body's gonna say, uh-oh, this guy's not eating, but don't break down his muscle because that's important. Break down the fat instead. It's kind of counter to what you might think. You think you fast and your body's gonna burn up what you use because it's like a car tire, right? You put a car tire on, you spin that tire, and you burn out, you're gonna burn up the rubber. Well, no, that's not how your body works. It's actually the opposite. Your body is very, very keen to preserve what is necessary for survival. You work out, the body preserves what it needs. So definitely during your fasts, moderate intensity lifting to maintain the muscle, moderate intensity cardio to stimulate the fat loss. Now I'm gonna to talk to ladies for just a second. Okay, some specifics that women need to know. And men, you can watch this so you can give it to your loved ones or you can just skip ahead to the next section in a couple of minutes. Intermittent fasting over the last couple of years has become one of the more powerful ways that women are getting PCOS and irregular menstruation under control. Okay, what we're starting to understand is that there is a very strong correlation between all these PCOS things we're seeing, potential autoimmune things, and just other irregularities as far as reproductive and even fertility is concerned, 
and metabolic health. Okay, so we see that the metabolism influences this, specifically with insulin resistance. Now, a large percentage of people are becoming insulin resistant, and when you look at women, the more adipose tissue, the more insulin resistance, the higher the likelihood of PCOS, and you look at that in correlational data. There's an interesting paper published in the Journal of Translational Medicine that had women with PCOS do five weeks of intermittent fasting, and they found that 73% of the women ended up correcting their abnormal menstrual cycles, and a huge chunk of them ended up improving their PCOS symptoms overall. Now, what we do have to understand is that for whatever reason, whether it be thyroid related or not, women want to inch their way into fasting a little bit slower. So ladies, you may want to start with like 12 or 14 hour fasts. The reason is, is because you have the ability to utilize fats very well from adrenaline burning it. Essentially adrenaline will stimulate these catecholamines, they stimulate the utilization of fat. Studies have demonstrated that women use fat better from fasting, which means that Short, short form, you would actually benefit from fasting better than a male would. But things start to change, like your TSH levels, your thyroid levels go down a little bit more with longer fasts. But once again, we see that as women adjust and become what's called fat adapted, men and women end up very equal in the spectrum of how they benefit from a fast. You just need to start a little bit slower. So do like 12 hour fast, then work up to 14, 16, whereas men might be able to jump in a little bit sooner. Okay, now that we've wrapped up the women stuff, let's get back into men and women. Let's talk about common concerns. The first one, because it's talked about too much and probably drilled into our head that we should be scared of it, are going to be thyroid concerns, decrease in thyroid. I want you to remember something. The thyroid is only a small percentage of our metabolism. We can have a low thyroid level and still have a fine metabolism. Our muscle, our resting energy expenditure, our non-exercise activity thermogenesis, a lot of these things drive our metabolism stronger than our thyroid. The point is, is that when you eat less and when you fast, your thyroid's going to go down, your thyroid hormone levels. Your TSH is gonna change, okay? You're going to see these levels whether you are a man or a woman. And once you adapt, you will be fine. We also have to remember that thyroid replenishes very easily. It's a very, very regenerative gland. So even if you depress function of the thyroid, it tends to come back pretty quick. So having a temporary reduction in thyroid levels is not necessarily the end of the world, especially if you're periodically reducing calories and then coming back up, reducing and then coming back up. The next concern that people have is muscle wasting, which we've addressed a little bit. You can fix this issue by making sure you move during your fast. Movement is key. You can make sure you correct this issue by getting adequate protein during your eating period. You can make sure you fix this issue by possibly adding things like essential amino acids to your meals. Some studies demonstrate that adding essential amino acids alongside protein can up to 4X the synthesis of the protein. So if you're really concerned about that, that's fine. But it really is somewhat of a moot point if you're only doing shorter fasts. Muscle wasting doesn't become much of an issue until after 24 hours, only if you're not really replenishing protein enough. What you wanna focus on is making sure you're moving, but also one of the things that you can do is decrease your carbohydrate consumption during your eating period and almost consider going keto during your eating period because it's gonna elevate ketones which could be muscle sparing. The bottom line is that lots of people with good amounts of muscle, myself included, fast and don't lose muscle. Don't be too worried about it. Another common concern is sleep, and this is probably one of the most valid ones, because intermittent fasting in general can disrupt your sleep. And it does this because of two reasons. One, you're fasting so much that you're spiking adrenaline and you're getting this chaos, right? That adrenaline's gonna keep you up. Number two is traditional intermittent fasting, you're stacking a lot of your calories later in the day, and unfortunately you end up eating a lot at night. This will disrupt sleep, okay? Lots of people, including Dr. Andrew Huberman and all these guys that we see all the time now, that is a big deal that they talk about. Don't eat too close to bed. When 80% of your calories are stacked in the last few hours of your waking hours, even if it's nighttime, not a good recipe. So ETRF, doing the flip side of fasting where you fast from say like 2 p.m. through the morning the next day, that could be hugely beneficial. Let's talk about supplements you can have during a fast. Number one, electrolytes. I'm always okay with electrolytes, okay? Element electrolytes, uh, myoscience electrolytes, uh, Ultima electrolytes. I prefer Element because they taste better in the higher sodium content, but electrolytes are fine. In fact, they are recommended so you can maintain sodium levels. Insulin levels go down when you fast, which primes the kidneys to excrete extra water. Creatine, you don't need to be doing a mega muscle building dose of it. Two grams is all you need, and it can help you retain water a little bit better in the muscle. It can help the brain out, and it can help you maintain that brute strength you might lose when glycogen 
glycogen depletion happens. Tyrosine is another thing that might help you out overall, just in fatty acid metabolism and in that switching of fuels. Then we have things like GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. GABA might help you feel a little bit more calm. You can take GABA in supplement form. You don't need much. You can take just a standard dose and that's gonna be fine, or even a half dose. Not necessary, but it does help you feel calmer if you get anxious during a fast. Acetyl-L-carnitine. People will say, well, we don't need carnitine. Our body creates it. We get enough from the diet. We're fine with carnitine. Carnitine is what allows fat to get into the mitochondria. It's a shuttle, okay? The uh, carnitine, or CPT, the carnitine palmitoyl transferase, it's what brings it in. Now, the problem is that if you are an active person, you can easily deplete 75 to 80% of your carnitine levels. Acetyl-L-carnitine can cross the blood-brain barrier and help provide fuel in a fat form to the brain. This is very important when you're doing a lower carb or when you're fasting because it's allowing the fuel to get into the brain and allows you to feel more sharp and alert. Caffeine is obviously fine. Okay, we talk about that a lot. Pure caffeine, coffee, caffeine pills, whatever. Rhodiola rosea. This is a great one if you're trying to feel a little bit calmer, you're trying to have an adaptogenic effect, it's a good one to add in. Glutamine is not a bad one either. Even though it is an amino acid, it will not spike your insulin and it helps with the gut. Okay, a lot of our immune system is in the gut and there are some studies looking at endurance people, people that are doing endurance work, glutamine supplementation decreased the instances of getting sick significantly. So I do recommend that one. And then B vitamins. You urinate out B vitamins, so feel free to take those in throughout the course of the day as well. Now that's during your fasting period. What about supplements during your eating period? During your eating period, it may not be a bad idea to add a multivitamin in. I don't like multivitamins a whole lot, but I also know that people don't always get what they need. Okay, so multivitamins might not be a bad idea. During your eating period is when you wanna add antioxidants, okay? You're eating a lot of food at once, which means that you're going to have a high amount of reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress. So antioxidants like vitamin C, things like maybe uh, bioastin, like astaxanthin, tremendous antioxidant. Uh, things like berry extracts, uh, one called Haskap berry, H-A-S-K-A-P. Eating fruits and vegetables that get you those antioxidants. Okay, glutathione, sulforaphane, these kinds of things are really good during your eating period to help give the body a little bit of an extra start to neutralize free radicals that might be coming in at warp speed. Essential amino acids, I mentioned earlier. Okay, essential amino acids with protein can increase the availability of protein and make it so that you synthesize more protein and ultimately restore and build more muscle. Fish oil is another good one, like I mentioned, to get those omega-3s up. But if you wanna take it one step further, cod liver oil is probably even better. You have vitamin D in cod liver oil, you have omega-3s in cod liver oil, and you have bioavailable retinol A, vitamin A in cod liver oil. Synthetic vitamin D might not be so good because it can deplete retinol A, but cod liver oil is giving you a triple whammy. So I recommend maybe a thousand milligrams of cod liver oil during your eating period, especially if you're not eating things like fatty fish or high omega-3 foods. Coenzyme Q10. Three to 600 milligrams of coenzyme Q10 can help out what's called the electron transport chain. Helps out with basically electrons converting into energy, which is very important during your eating period to utilize the food and get the electrons from the food to where it needs to go. MCT oil, another good one. Even though it's a food, it's still a supplement. So I would recommend that one during your eating period too. If you're a guy and you wanna improve libido, Tonkat Ali works really well as well. Very powerful, very multi-prong approach to control estrogen, reduce estrogen, and increase testosterone. Alcohol, I'm just gonna touch on this for a second. On the days that you're fasting, I highly recommend that you cut it out. Alcohol suppresses fatty acid oxidation, which is the last thing you wanna do after a fast. You have an afterburn effect where you continue to burn fat into your eating period, just cut out the alcohol, you don't need it. Touching on the common mistakes for a moment. Common mistake number one, not eating enough during your eating period. People think they're eating too much. No, you're usually not eating enough, therefore your metabolism shrinks as time goes on. What do you know? Next thing you know, your resting energy expenditure, your metabolic rate has decreased, and the moment you do go off the wagon, you gain weight, and then you blame it on fasting. When in reality, you should still control your caloric intake to be as close to what you would normally eat as possible and let the fasting period do the work for you. Within that same vein, the next mistake is fasting too frequently. And fasting too frequently will lead to this caloric restriction. I've said this many times before, but fasting should be the anomaly, not the norm, okay? Fast randomly, three or four days per week. Keep your body guessing, so this is your norm, and this is a random shock to the body. Normal, fasting. All of a sudden you get massive, quick adjustment and quick reflection and the body has to lose weight because it's a shock, right? So fast infrequently, 
with good effectiveness. Another mistake is like I mentioned before, is breaking too late in the evening and affecting sleep. One of the biggest levers that you can pull to improve your health overall is getting better sleep. And if you wear an Aura or a Whoop or anything like that, you can watch it. On the days you break your fast late and eat too close before bed, I bet you anything your recovery scores are a lot worse. I wanna end on something very, very important because over the last five years, what I've really learned is that fasting maintains its extreme benefit and power if you can retain the extreme benefit of power and power and don't let it become white noise to your lifestyle. So in other words, keep it as a shock. But how do you know you're fasting too much? These are the signs you know you're fasting too much. Number one, you're no longer hungry during your fasts. Now you shouldn't be like starving during your fasts, but you also shouldn't be like totally satiated to the point where like, oh, I could fast forever. That is an indicator that your body's metabolic rate has slowed down. Hunger is a good thing, and studies are now suggesting that ghrelin, the hunger hormone, is actually driving a lot of the benefits of fasting. Okay, so probably one of the largest benefits is this increase in ghrelin, which is driving adaptive, adaptive excuse me, adaptations and adaptive processes to make us better at fasting. But we wanna retain that selectiveness so that it's not just happening all the time where the body says, ah, oh, you're used to fasting, whatever. No, don't, don't worry about burning the fat. This is just the normal thing that Bob does. No, if that starts to happen, take some time off and then go back to it. And when you're hungry again, you know it's working. If you're to a point where you can no longer break your fast properly, where you're so adapted to fasting that you're just like, oh, it's fine, dude, I'm just gonna eat this cake. It's fine, I'm gonna grab a Snickers. It's fine, I'm gonna go to Del Taco and break my fast with that. When that is happening, that is an indicator that hormones, leptin signaling, all this is cattywampus. Take some time off. If you start getting weak, that's another sign. You're probably eating too little and you need to take some time off. Trust me, you'll get more benefit if you take time off. If you're a lady and your menstrual cycle becomes disrupted, that is a very big one as well. So you gotta be paying very close attention to that. And lastly, if you come out in the morning and someone knocked down your mailbox with a baseball bat. I'll see you tomorrow.